What's up guys, this is Jerry. So I've been wanting to make this video for a very long time. And I thought this was the perfect moment. You know, I had a little breakdown, mental breakdown, and it's time to just do this before I put it off some more. This is my critique of guns, germs, and steel. This will be multiple parts. So be prepared for a lot of information, but I have my problems with the book. It's a great book and it definitely revolutionized how people think about history, but I think you ask historians, you ask sociologists, you ask people who study climate, I think they can point out a lot of problems with this book. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to bring up, this is the first part of my critique of Jerry Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. So Jerry Diamond basically starts his book with the question. I have a map here. I freaking love maps. You know, his question is, why did this become powerful, and this little bit, aka Europe, become powerful. Why didn't this rule over this? Or why didn't this rule over this? Why did these guys get ruled over by them, right? That's basically what is the question he posed in his book is, why is the world the way we see it today? Why is the West strong? Why is the East rising? Why is Africa? Why are the Pacific Island countries like colonized, etc.? It's a good question. So, through his exploration, I believe Jared Diamond started out as a biologist or something. He started looking at, from that perspective of a hard science. So, Jerry Diamond's ultimate conclusion from him going to different countries, studying different cultures, etc., studying history, is that it comes down to geography, right? Right here. Here's a map for you. This is a flat um, projection of around planet, 3D planet. So there's going to be areas and shapes that are off. But, you know, we have the equator, right? The hottest region here. Then we have the two tropics. I'm from right around here. And then we have this area, temperate area. And then we have the Arctic. So the reason why it's warmer here than it's here is because of a concept in physics. When you have light, you see, depending on what angle light shines on a surface, the power gets spread out, the energy gets spread out because of the angle. So, for example, very far from the equator, see, light has less energy over an area than, let's say, if somewhere where light from the sun directly shines. So this is basically, if you understand this concept in physics, you'll understand why it's colder up here than it's colder here. This concept basically can explain 90% of temperature differences, you know, as you travel farther north or farther south from the equator. So now that we know that because of the way physics works, and the fact that the Earth is a globe, and the fact that the Earth has a tilt, and the fact that sunlight hits different parts of the Earth at a different angle, it creates different temperatures. With temperature comes weather, right? Different temperature variations comes weather. So different climate patterns, different temperatures, which these things together create different types of crops, different types of animals, different types of rainfall, which create preconditions for different types of people, different types of cultures to evolve. That's basically the first part of sort of the geographical analysis of how history started, so to speak. Now, the second part of Jared Diamond's conclusion, it's not just about where you are on Earth. It's also about the shape of the continent and the area around you. So... For example, if you look at North America and South America, it's very north-south focused, right? You have to go this way to traverse the continent. If you look at Africa, Africa is much bigger than this. It's just because of the projection, the way you put a three-dimensional thing on a two-dimensional. Africa looks small. Africa is actually, can, you can put Russia and China and America and Brazil in Africa, but Africa is also a north-south type of type of um, continent. Now, if you compare that to, let's say, Europe or 
a lot of Asia, it's more east-west. So why does that matter? Remember, we established already that you go north, you go south, the climate, the temperature changes, right? So it's different fauna, different flora. Fauna, flora means different plants, different animals. Now, if you're going east and west, you're in sort of the same temperature zone, right? You're in the same temperature and climate zone. So it's easier for animals, it's easier for people, it's easier for crops to survive you know, in similar climates, so to speak. So basically, what Jared Diamond is saying is Europe and probably Asia made it easier for ideas to spread. You know, you invent a new type of agriculture, you think of something else, it's easier for it to travel this way than for a new idea, new something to travel this way. So that's the second part of geography and why it affects people, culture, plants, etc. So now we go back to the title, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Germs is like a biological thing, right? Germs can be applied again to this paradigm. It's much easier for germs and stuff like that to spread this way you put something that's developed for a specific climate, a virus, a bacteria, you put it up here, it's probably not going to do as well. So it's easier for germs to go this way than it's, it's for germs to go this way. That's why, for example, Ebola, right? Ebola hasn't spread this way or this way because it's like it's trapped here. That's where it thrives. Whereas, let's say something like plague or something like that, measles fucking going everywhere. You know, Genghis Khan brought it all the way to Europe. Now, guns and steel are more sort of the cultural components. Why did guns come from China, go to Europe? Why did they have steel? Why didn't they have steel? Again, it can be traced back to geography and climate, but it's not biological. It's more like how did geography and the geographical limitations, etc., cause these ideas, these technologies to spread and develop quicker? But ultimately, you can tell guns, germs, and steel, it goes back to geography. So a lot of historians, a lot of sociologists, etc., they call this book geographical determinism because geography leads to certain types of cultures and certain types of biological sort of systems, whether you can call it immunity or whatever, body types. And so geography leads to cultural determinism and biological determinism, which then leads to historical determinism. It, that's what created what history and how history evolved and history went the way it is. You know, it couldn't have been any different because of geography. So I basically just very, very, very generally summarized what Jared Diamond's books about and his various chapters. You know, some of them are more science focused. Okay, how did certain crops get domesticated easier in places like the Fertile Crescent. Some chapters are like, okay, how did um how did the the West sort of conquer America, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So but ultimately it goes back to geographical determinism. So where you are, you know, by chance Maybe you ended up here, maybe by chance you were born here, your culture, civilization, you know, by chance, wherever you were, ultimately, because of ge geography, will determine the fate of your civilization. It's very interesting, and you, know, you look at it on the surface, it seems to make a lot of sense, right? It's like, you know, there's so much uncertainty when it comes to social science, so much uncertainty when it comes to history. So he's trying to be scientific and be like, these are the preconditions, and then it leads to these post-conditions. So what are my problems with it? Let's go and explore my problems with it. So to explain my first problem with guns, germs, and steel, we have to think in the time frame of civilizations. I will hopefully, fingers crossed, I will live until I'm 100. But most civilizations are longer than one generation. Most civilizations are at least 200 years, maybe 300 years, 400 years. I mean, the Egyptian civilization before it got conquered by the Greeks, like they were when they when they started out, mammoths were still 
like living there were still mammoths on earth so like some civilizations go you know china likes to brag that it's 5000 years i mean egypt was probably like 10000 years anyways that's the time frame of a civilization so for the geographical argument to work when it comes to civilizations you would have to basically assume that temperatures rainfall everything else related to climate was pretty much constant during and before the existence of the civilization to create all these biological and cultural factors. So basically, my first critique of guns, germs, and seal is that the preconditions, all the prior a priori kind of assumptions, I don't think Jared Diamond put as much thought into it as probably a non-physicist or a non-biologist or a non-hard scientist would. So let me show you some graphs to explain what I mean. So my first graph is 1901 to 2015. Look at how much rainfall, just over about 100 years, right? A, a little bit more than 100 years. Look at how rainfall changes just in the United States. Even in a little segment of North America, Rainfall changes. You know, when rainfall changes, what changes? Crop yields, the, the amount of bugs, the amount of disease, etc., etc., etc. Everything changes based on how much rainfall you have. So just within 100 years, look how much rainfall has changed. The next graph is two parts. The first part is the fact that our sun has a cycle. Our sun creates more energy over the span of 11 years. It's like a cyclical thing. Basically, what the first graph is showing is that the sun's solar output, the energy from the sun, is not constant. So everywhere on Earth will be getting different energy amounts from the sun every 11 years. It's a cycle. And then the next graph here is how the temperature has changed based on deep ocean measurements. Just look at how temperatures have have changed since the dinosaurs, right? The dinosaurs died about 66, 65 million years ago. And look how since then the temperatures of the ocean, which can correlate with temperatures on other parts of Earth, how they've changed. The next graph is even more long-term. It's just different ways to track global temperatures. Look look how, there's, there's definitely cycles, right? A lot of people going on and decide about global warming and stuff. The globe cools and warms. It's not just human. But, of course, if you look at the second graph, that's the hockey puck, the classic hockey puck graph, right? It looks like it's going higher than anything we've had before. Whatever the case, look at how temperatures change. And if you look at the second graph, the first graph is over a lot of years. Like, the first graph is over hundreds of thousands of years. The second graph is from 500, the year 500 to 2000. So the second graph is within the time span of sort of current humans, right? Look at how much the temperature has changed just over the course of these years. Now we have global land ocean temperature index. Look at how the temperature just from 1880 to 2000, look how much it's changed. It's gone up, it's gone down, it's gone up, it's gone down. This one's very interesting. Through different ways of correlating and through tracking isotopes, etc., carbon dioxide amounts. Carbon dioxide, etc., these are greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases, they trap heat that escapes from Earth. So the more greenhouse gas you have, the more heat gets retained. It's like having a blanket. So carbon dioxide amounts are changing. Temperatures are changing for a variety of reasons which causes rainfall to change, climate to change, and all nine yards. So I hope you see where this is, where I'm going with this. I don't see any period on Earth, even within a span of 10 years, where climate's constant anywhere. So where are your preconditions? You know, how, I get the temperatures are always going to be slightly colder, let's say, at the North Pole than in the equator, but even within different parts of the equator, different parts of sort of the temperate regions, the climate's constantly changing. So there goes your sort of preconditions, your geographical preconditions. They're not constant. So I'm going to devote a special little chapter here to El Nino slash La Nina. 
So for those of you who don't know what El Nino, La Nina is, it's a cyclical ocean current pattern in the Pacific Ocean. And I don't know exactly how it works. I don't think scientists even know exactly how it works. But what happens is sometimes parts of the Pacific Ocean are a little warmer, which causes a little bit more moisture to be pulled up into the atmosphere and it changes weather patterns all over North America. And then sometimes the ocean currents in said region of the Pacific Ocean are much cooler. So it causes a more drier, colder type of um, climate change for a few years or maybe a year in North America. It's a very, very surface explanation. I'm sure it's much more complicated. So these next graphs, they're basically, you don't have to worry too much about what exactly they mean. All you have to see is that there's a lot of cyclicalness to this El Nino La Nina pattern. And these various graphs through different types of measurements, some are sea surface temperatures, some are other things. You'll see how even in North America, these ocean currents will drastically change the climate, the medium range or even short range climate trends. It doesn't matter that you know North America is in some specific temperature zone or whatever geography. It's like there's so many other factors to affect everything related to climate in just this one little zone. And it's been going on since the beginning of time, since Earth started having climates. So how, as Jared Diamond, are you going to generalize a specific climate slash geographical precondition to a specific region when it's constantly changing? This kind of pattern, I don't know exactly how it's being caused, but it's not related really to greenhouse gases or solar output. So again, what I'm trying to show you guys is that there's a lot of different things that affect climate on Earth. It's not a constant state, right? A civilization throughout its span is enduring lots of different climate changes. Another way to describe what Jared Diamond's trying to do to history is called reductionism. Basically, you try to narrow everything down into the most essential bare bones components. But I think what you've seen from the past few minutes is that the preconditions for the emergence of any kind of human civilization is much more chaotic, right? It's almost not classical physics, but it's almost like quantum mechanics. There's a lot of uncertainty. What Jared Diamond's trying to do with his reductionism just doesn't work in this type of uncertainty when, yeah, of course, you know, certain regions are maybe a little drier, certain regions are a little hotter, but even that fluctuates like crazy. So you really can't just say, yeah, this is the precondition for um, West African civilizations and how they emerged. And this is what China was. And this is what North America was. And this is what the Fertile Crescent was. This is what Europe was. Because depending on which hundreds of years, which 50 years, which 10 years span, it would have been different. And it would have changed the biology, the domesticatable crops, animals, people, blah, 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 etc. So... Lots of uncertainty, man. So where are we going to go from here? I'm going to stop the video here. Where are we going to go from here? I have so much more written down about this. You know, I, I will look at Jared Diamond's thoughts about domestication of horses, about a lot of other things. And I'm not going to say I disagree with everything he says, but I will propose to you other ways of looking at it that, in fact, in a way, are even more reductionist than he it's trying to be. And maybe they make more sense, right? There's a concept called Occam's razor. Sometimes the simplest explanation is the best. And there might be even simpler explanations than what he's trying to say with all this geographical determinism leading to cultural and biological determinism, which causes historical determinism. So we will continue this. I'm so glad I did this, by the way. And I hope you guys like this thing I'm doing because I've procrastinated on this for so long, for more than a year. I've wanted to make this video for more than a year. And if my little mental breakdown yielded this, I guess I'm happy. But we will talk more about Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel next time. Jared Diamond, if you see this, I look forward to hearing your thoughts. I have a lot more to say. And if I misinterpreted anything you said, please let me know. 
Okay, guys, for everyone watching, thank you so much. Press like, press subscribe, leave your comments below. And if you want me to look at any other areas or if you have things to say about this, please, please, please share with me privately or publicly in the comments, whatever. Let us keep exploring this book. All right, bye-bye.